Abiding Christ, Chapter 1, by Andrew Murray. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia Barrett. Abide in Christ, Chapter 1. All you who have come to Him, come unto me. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Abide in me. John fifteen four. It is to you who have heard and hearkened to the call, come unto me, that this new invitation comes. Abide in me. The message comes from the same loving Savior. You doubtless have never repented having come at His call. You experienced that His word was truth, all His promises He fulfilled. He made you partakers of the blessings and the joy of His love. Was not His welcome most hearty, His pardon full and free, His love most sweet and precious? You more than once, at your first coming to Him, had reason to say, They have was not told me. And yet, you have had to complain of disappointment. As time went on, your expectations were not realized. The blessings you once enjoyed were lost. The love and joy of your first meeting with your Savior, instead of deepening, have become faint and feeble. And often you have wondered what the reason could be, that with such a Savior, so mighty and so loving, your experience of salvation should not have been a fuller one. The answer is very simple. You wander from Him. The blessings He bestows are all connected with His come to me, and are only to be enjoyed in close fellowship with Himself. You either did not fully understand or did not rightly remember that the call meant, Come to me, to stay with me. And yet this was in very deed his object and purpose when first he called you to himself. It was not to refresh you for a few short hours after your conversion with the joy of his love and deliverance, and then to send you forth to wander in sadness and sin. He had destined you to something better than a short-lived blessedness, to be enjoyed only in times of special earnestness and prayer, and then to pass away, as you had to turn to those duties in which far the greater part of life has to be spent. No, indeed, he had prepared for you an abiding dwelling with himself, where your whole life and every moment of it might be spent, where the work of your daily life might be done, and where all the while you might be enjoying unbroken communion with himself. It was even this he meant when to that first word, Come to me, he added this, Abide in me, as earnest and faithful, as loving and tender, as the compassion that breathed in that blessed Come was the grace that added this, no less blessed, abide, as mighty as the attraction with which that first word drew you, where the bonds with which this second, had you but listened to it, would have kept you, and as great as were the blessings with which that coming was rewarded, so large, yea, and much greater, were the treasures to which that abiding would have given you access. And observe, especially, it was not that he said, Come to me and abide with me, but abide in me. The intercourse was not only to be unbroken, but most intimate and complete. He opened his arms to press you to his bosom. He opened his heart to welcome you there. He opened up all his divine fullness of life and love and offered to take you up into its fellowship, to make you wholly one with himself. There was a depth of meaning you cannot yet realize in his words, Abide in me. And with no less earnestness than he had cried, Come to me, did he plead, Had you but noticed it, Abide in me. By every motive that he induced you to come, did he beseech you to abide. Was it the fear of sin and its curse that first drew you? The pardon you receive on first coming could with all the blessings flowing from it, only be confirmed and fully enjoyed on abiding in Him? Was it the longing to know and enjoy the infinite love that was calling you? The first coming gave but single drops to taste. Tis only the abiding that can really satisfy the thirsty soul, 
and give to drink of the rivers of pleasure that are at his right hand. Was it the weary longing to be made free from the bondage of sin, to become pure and holy, and so to find rest, the rest of God for the soul? This too can only be realized as you abide in him. Only abiding in Jesus gives rest in him. Or, if it was the hope of an inheritance in glory and an everlasting home in the presence of the Infinite One, the true preparation for this, as well as its blessed foretaste in this life, are granted only to those who abide in Him. In very truth, there is nothing that moves you to come that does not plead with thousandfold greater force, Abide in Him. You did well to come. You do better to abide. Who would, after seeking the king's palace, be content to stand in the door when he is invited in to dwell in the king's presence and share with him in all the glory of his royal life? Oh, let us enter in and abide and enjoy to the full all the rich supply his wondrous love had prepared for us. And yet I fear that there are many who have indeed come to Jesus, and who yet have mournfully to confess that they know but little of this blessed abiding in Him. With some, the reason is that they never fully understood that this was the meaning of the Savior's call. With others, that though they heard the word, they did not know that such a life of abiding fellowship was possible, and indeed within their reach. Others will say that, though they did believe that such a life was possible and seek after it, they have never yet succeeded discovering the secret of its attainment. And others, again, alas, will confess that it is their own unfaithfulness that has kept them from the enjoyment of the blessing. When the Savior would have kept them, they were not found ready to stay. They were not prepared to give up everything and always, only, wholly to abide in Jesus. To all such I come now in the name of Jesus, the Redeemer, and mine, with the blessed message, Abide in me. In his name I invite them to come, and for a season meditate with me daily on its meaning, its lessons, its claims, and its promises. I know how many, and to the younger believer, how difficult the questions are which suggest themselves in connection with it. There is especially the question, with its various aspects, to the possibility, in the midst of wearying work and continual distraction, of keeping up, or rather being kept in, the abiding communion. I do not undertake to remove all difficulties. This Jesus Christ himself alone must do by his Holy Spirit. But what I would fain, by the grace of God, be permitted to do is to repeat day by day the Master's blessed command, Abide in me, until it enter the heart and find a place there, no more to be forgotten or neglected. I would fain that in the light of Holy Scripture we should meditate on its meaning until the understanding, that gate to the heart, opens to apprehend something of what it offers and expects. So we shall discover the means of its attainment and learn to know what keeps us from it and what can help us to it. So we shall feel its claims and be compelled to acknowledge that there can be no true allegiance to our King without simply and heartily accepting this one, too, of His commands. So we shall gaze on its blessedness until desire be inflamed, and the will with all its energies be roused to claim and possess the unspeakable blessing. Come, my brethren, and let us day by day set ourselves at his feet, and meditate on this word of his, with an eye fixed on him alone. Let us set ourselves in quiet trust before him, waiting to hear his holy voice the still small voice that is mightier than the storm that rends the rocks, breathing its quickening spirit within us as he speaks, Abide in me. The soul that truly hears Jesus himself speak the word receives with the word the power to accept and to hold the blessing he offers. And it may please thee, blessed Savior, indeed, to speak to us. Let each of us hear thy blessed voice. May the feeling of our deep need and the faith of thy wondrous love combine with the sight of the wonderfully blessed life thou art waiting to bestow upon us. Constrain us to listen and to obey as often as thou speakest. Abide in me. 
Let day by day the answer from our heart be clearer and fuller. Blessed Savior, I do abide in Thee. End of Abide in Christ Chapter 1 Recorded by Claudia Barrett Alone in London, Chapter 1, Not Alone, by Hesba Stretton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Not Alone. It had been a close and sultry day, one of the hottest of the dog days, even out in the open country, where the dusky green leaves had never stirred upon their stems since the sunrise, and where the birds had found themselves too languid for any songs beyond a faint chirp now and then. All day long the sun had shone down steadily upon the streets of London, with a fierce glare and glowing heat, until the barefooted children had felt the dusty pavement burn under their tread, almost as painfully as the icy pavement had frozen their naked feet in the winter. In the parks, and in every open space, especially about the cool splash of the fountains at Charing Cross, the people, who had escaped from the crowded and unventilated back streets, basked in the sunshine, or sought every corner where a shadow could be found. But in the alleys and slums the air was heavy with heat and dust, and thick vapours floated up and down, charged with sickening smells from the refuse of fish and vegetables decaying in the gutters. Overhead the small straight strip of sky was almost white, and the light, as it fell, seemed to quiver with the burden of its own burning heat. Out of one of the smaller thoroughfares lying between Holborn and the Strand, there opens a narrow alley, not more than six or seven feet across, with high buildings on each side. In the most part the ground floors consist of small shops, for the alley is not a blind one, but leads from the thoroughfare to another street, and forms, indeed, a shortcut to it pretty often used. These shops are not of any size or importance, a greengrocer's, with a somewhat scanty choice of vegetables and fruit, a broker's displaying queer odds and ends of household goods, two or three others, and at the end farthest from the chief thoroughfare, but nearest to the quiet and respectable street beyond, a very modest-looking little shop window containing a few newspapers, some rather yellow packets of stationery, and two or three books of ballads. Above the door was painted, in very small dingy letters, the words, James Oliver, News Agent. The shop was even smaller in proportion than its window. After two customers had entered, if such an event could ever come to pass, it would have been almost impossible to find room for a third. Along the end ran a little counter, with a falling flap by which admission could be gained to the living room lying behind the shop. This evening the flap was down, a certain sign that James Oliver, the news agent, had some guest within, for otherwise there would have been no occasion to lessen the scanty size of the counter. The room beyond was dark, very dark indeed, for the time of day, for, though the evening was coming on, and the sun was hastening to go down at last, it had not yet ceased to shine brilliantly upon the great city. But inside James Oliver's house the gas was already lighted in a little steady flame, which never flickered in the still hot air, though both door and window were wide open. For there was a window, though it was easy to overlook it, opening into passage four feet wide, which led darkly up into a still closer and hotter court, lying in the very core of the maze of streets. As the houses were four stories high, it is easy to understand that very little sunlight could penetrate to Oliver's room behind his shop, and that even at noonday it was twilight there. This room was of a better size altogether than a stranger might have supposed, having two or three queer little nooks and recesses borrowed from the space belonging to the adjoining house, for the buildings were old and had probably been one large dwelling in former times. It was plainly the only apartment the owner had, and all its arrangements were those of a man living alone, for there was something almost desolate about the look of the scanty furniture, though it was clean and whole. There had been a fire, but it had died out, and the coals were black in the grate, while the kettle still sat upon the top bar with a melancholy expression of neglect about it. James Oliver himself had placed his chair near to the open door, where he could keep his eye upon the shop, and need this precaution, as at this hour no customers ever turned into it. He was an old man, and seemed very old and infirm by the dim light. 
He was thin and spare, with that peculiar spareness which results from the habit of always eating less than one can. His teeth, which had never had too much to do, had gone some years ago, and his cheeks fell in rather deeply. A fine network of wrinkles puckered about the corners of his eyes and mouth. He stooped a good deal, and moved about with the slowness and deliberation of age. Yet his face was very pleasant, a cheery, gentle, placid face, lighted up with a smile now and then, but with sufficient rareness to make it the more welcome and the more noticed when it came. Old Oliver had a visitor this hot evening, a neat, small, dapper woman, with a little likeness to himself, who had been putting his room to rights and looking to the repairs needed by his linen. She was just replacing her needle, cotton, and buttons in an old-fashioned housewife, which she always carried in her pocket, and was then going to put on her black silk bonnet and coloured shawl, before bidding him good-bye. "'A Charlotte,' said Oliver, after drawing a long and toilsome breath. "'What would I give to be atop of the wreck and see in the sunset this evening? Many and money's the summer afternoon we've spent there when we were young and all of us alive. Dost remember how many a mile of country we could see all round us, and how fresh the air blew across the thousands of green fields?' Why, I saw Snowdon once, more than sixty miles off, when my eyes were young and it was a clear sunset. I always think of the top of the reckon when I read of Moses going up Mount Pisgah, and seeing all the land about him, north and south, east and west. Eh, hey, lass, there's a change in us all now. Ah, it's like another world, said the old woman, shaking her head slowly. All the folks I used to sew for at Aston and Uppington and Overhill Hill, they'd mostly be gone or dead by now. It wouldn't seem like the same place at all. "'And now there's none but you and me left, Brother James. "'Well, well, it's lonesome growing old.' "'Yes, lonesome, yet not exactly lonesome,' replied old Oliver in a dreamy voice. "'I'm growing dark a little, and just a trifle deaf, "'and I don't feel quite myself like I used to do. "'But I've got something I didn't used to have. "'Sometimes of an evening, before I've lit the gas, "'I've a sort of feeling as if I could almost see the Lord Jesus "'and hear him talking to me. "'He looks to me something like our eldest brother, "'him that died when we were little.' "'Charlotte, thee remembers him? "'A white, quiet, patient face, "'with a smile like the sun shining behind clouds. "'Well, whether it's only a dream or no, I can't tell. "'But there's a face looks at me, "'or seems to look at me out of the dusk, "'and I think to myself, maybe the Lord Jesus says, "'Old Oliver's lonesome down there in the dark, "'and his eyes grow dim. "'I'll make myself half plain to him. "'Then he comes and sits with me here for a little while. "'Oh, that's all fancy as comes with you living quite alone,' "'said Charlotte sharply. "'Perhaps so, perhaps so,' answered the old man with a meek sigh. "'But I should be very lonesome without that.' They did not speak again until Charlotte had given a final shake to the bed in the corner, upon which her bonnet and shawl had been lying. She put them on neatly and primly, and when she was ready to go she spoke again in a constrained and mysterious manner. "'Heard nothing of Susan, I suppose,' she said. "'Not a word,' answered old Oliver sadly. "'It's the only trouble I've got.' That were the last passion I ever went into, and I was hot and hasty, I know. "'So you always used to be at times,' said his sister. "'Ah, but that passion was the worst of all,' he went on, speaking slowly. "'I told her if she married young Raleigh, she should never darken my doors again, never again. And she took me at my word, though she might have known it was nothing but father's hot temper. Darken my doors! Why, the brightest sunshine I could have would be to see her come smiling into my shop, like she used to do at home.' "'Well, I think Susan ought to have humbled herself,' said Charlotte. "'It's going on for six years now, and she's had time enough to see her folly. "'Do you know where she is?' "'I know nothing about her,' he answered, shaking his head sorrowfully. "'Young Raleigh was wild, very wild, and that was my objection to him. "'But I didn't mean Susan to take me at my word. "'I shouldn't speak so hasty and hot now. "'And to think I'd helped to bring her up so genteel and with such pretty manners,' "'cried the old woman indignantly. She might have done so much better with her cleverness, too. Such a milliner as she might have turned out. Well, good-bye, Brother James, and don't go having any more of those visions. They're not wholesome for you. I should be very lonesome without them, answered Oliver. Good-bye, Charlotte, good-bye, and God bless you. Come again as soon as you can. He went with her to the door and stayed to watch her along the quiet alley till she turned into the street. Then with a last nod to the back of her bonnet, as she passed out of his sight, he returned slowly into his dark shop, put up the flap of the canter, and retreated to the darker room within. Hot as it was, he fancied it was growing a little chilly with the coming of the night, and he drew on his old cloak and threw a handkerchief over his white head, 
and then sat down in the dusk, looking out into his shop and the alley beyond it. He must have fallen into a doze after a while, being overcome with the heat, and lulled by the constant hum of the streets, which reached his dull ear in a softened murmur, for at length he started up almost in a fright, and found that complete darkness had fallen upon him suddenly, as it seemed to him. A church clock was striking nine, and his shop was not closed yet. He went out hurriedly to put the shutters up. End of Alone in London, Chapter 1 Not Alone By Hesba Stretton Apocalipsis Capítulo primero De la versión de la Biblia Reina Valera Antigua Esta es una grabación para LibriVox. Todas las grabaciones de LibriVox están en el dominio público. Para más información o para ser voluntario, visite LibriVox.org. Grabado por Claudia Barrett. Apocalipsis capítulo primero. La revelación de Jesucristo que Dios le dio para manifestar a sus siervos las cosas que deben suceder presto, y la declaró, enviándola por su ángel a Juan, su siervo el cual ha dado testimonio de la palabra de Dios y del testimonio de Jesucristo y de todas las cosas que ha visto. Bienaventurado el que lee y los que oyen las palabras de esta profecía y guardan las cosas en ella escritas, porque el tiempo está cerca. Juan a las siete iglesias que están en Asia. Gracia sea con vosotros, y paz del que es y que era y que ha de venir y de los siete espíritus que están delante de su trono, y de Jesucristo, el testigo fiel, el primogénito de los muertos, y príncipe de los reyes de la tierra, al que nos amó, y nos ha lavado de nuestros pecados con su sangre, y nos ha hecho reyes y sacerdotes para Dios y su Padre. A él sea gloria e imperio, para siempre jamás. Amén. He aquí que viene con las nubes, y todo ojo le verá, y los que le traspasaron, y todos los linajes de la tierra se lamentarán sobre él. Así sea. Amén. Yo soy el alfa y la omega, principio y fin, dice el Señor, que es y que era y que ha de venir, el Todopoderoso. Yo, Juan, vuestro hermano, y participante en la tribulación y en el reino, y en la paciencia de Jesucristo, estaba en la isla que es llamada Patmos, por la palabra de Dios y el testimonio de Jesucristo. Yo fui en el Espíritu en el día del Señor, y oí detrás de mí una gran voz, como de trompeta, que decía, Yo soy el Alfa y Omega, el primero y el último. Escribe en un libro lo que ves, y envíalo a las siete iglesias que están en Asia, a Efeso, a Esmirna y a Pérgamo y a Tiatira, y a Sardis, y a Filadelfia, y a la Odisea. Y me volví a ver la voz que hablaba conmigo, y vuelto, vi siete candeleros de oro. Y en medio de los siete candeleros, uno semejante al hijo del hombre, vestido de una ropa que llegaba hasta los pies, y ceñido por los pechos con una cinta de oro. Y su cabeza y sus cabellos eran blancos como la lana blanca, como la nieve, y sus ojos como llama de fuego, y sus pies semejantes al latón fino, ardientes como en un horno, y su voz como ruido de muchas aguas. Y tenía en su diestra siete estrellas, y de su boca salía una espada aguda de dos filos, y su rostro era como el sol cuando resplandece en su fuerza. Y cuando yo le vi, caí como muerto a sus pies, y él puso su diestra sobre mí, diciéndome, No temas, yo soy el primero y el último, y el que vivo, y he sido muerto, y he aquí que vivo por los siglos de siglos. Amén. Y tengo las llaves del infierno y de la muerte. Escribe las cosas que has visto, y las que son, y las que han de ser después de estas. El misterio de las siete estrellas que has visto en mi diestra, y los siete candeleros de oro. Las siete estrellas son los ángeles de las siete iglesias, y los siete candeleros que has visto son las siete iglesias. Fin 
de Apocalipsis capítulo primero, grabado por Claudia Barrett. Section one of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is a Whipperfox coin. All Whipperfox coins are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit whipperfox.org. Recording by Glenn O'Brien, www.glennoebryan.net The Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Section 1 How can all ye people of my church, except the voice of him who dwells on high, and whose eyes are upon all men? Yea, very, I say, how can ye people from afar, and ye that are upon the islands of the sea, listen together? For verily, the voice of the Lord is unto all men, and there is none to escape, and there is no eye that shall not see, neither ear that shall not hear, neither heart that shall not be penetrated. And the rebellious shall be pierced with much sorrow, for the iniquities shall be spoken upon the housetops, and their secret acts shall be revealed. And the voice of warning shall be unto all people, but the mouths of my disciples, whom I have chosen in these last days, and they shall go forth, and none shall stay them, for I the Lord have commanded them. Behold, this is mine authority, and the authority of my servants, and my preface unto the book of my commandments, which I have given them to publish unto you, O inhabitants of the earth. Wherefore, fear and tremble, all ye people, for what I the Lord have decreed in them shall be fulfilled. In February I say unto you, that they who go forth, Hearing these tithes unto the inhabitants of the earth, to them is power given the seal both on earth and in heaven, the unbelieving and rebellious. Yea, verily to seal them up unto the day when the wrath of God shall be poured out upon the wicked without measure, unto the day when the Lord shall come to recompense unto every man according to his work, and measure to every man according to the measure which he has measured to his fellow men. Wherefore, the voice of the Lord is unto the ends of the earth, that all that will hear may hear. Prepare ye, prepare ye for that which is to come, for the Lord is nigh. And the anger of the Lord is kindled, and his sword is bathed in heaven, and it shall fall upon the inhabitants of the earth. And the arm of the Lord shall be revealed, and the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, nor for the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. For they have swayed for mine ordinances, and have broken mine everlasting covenant. They seek not the world to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way, and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the whiteness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, we shall fall. Wherefore, I the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph of Sicinia, and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also gave commandments to others, that they should proclaim these things unto the world, and all this that it might be fulfilled, which is written by the prophets. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones, that men should not counsel his fellow men, nor would trust in the arm of flesh. But that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Saviour of the world. That faith also might increase in the earth, that mine everlasting covenant might be established that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world, and before kings and rulers. Behold, I am God, and have spoken it. These commandments are of me, and were given unto my servants in their weakness, after the manner of their language, that they might come to understanding. And inasmuch as they erred, it might be made known, and inasmuch as they sought wisdom, they might be instructed, and inasmuch as they sinned, they might be chastened, that they might repent. 
and inasmuch as they were humble, they might be made strong, and blessed from on high, and receive knowledge from time to time. And after having received the work of the Nephites, yea, even my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., my power to translate through the mercy of God, by the power of God, the Book of Mormon. And also those to whom these commandments were given, might have power to lay the foundation of this church, and to bring it forth out of obscurity and out of darkness, the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth, with which I, the Lord, am well pleased, speaking unto the church collectively and not individually. For I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. And he that repents not from him shall be taken even the light which he has received. For my spirit shall not always strive with men, saith the Lord of hosts. And again, verily, I say unto you, O inhabitants of the earth, I, the Lord, am willing to make these things known unto all flesh. For I am no respecter of persons, and will that all men shall know that the day speedily cometh. The hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand, when peace shall be taken from the earth, and the devil shall have power over his own dominion. And also the Lord shall have power over his saints, and shall reign in their midst, and shall come down in treasure upon Edomea, or the world. Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself, and though the heavens and the earth pass away, my will shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. For behold, and lo, the word is God, and the Spirit beareth record, and the record is true, and the truth abideth for ever and ever. Amen. End of section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants Facing the World, Chapter 1 Harry Receives a Letter by Horatio Alger, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piper Reed Harry Receives a Letter Here's a letter for you, Harry, said George Howard. I was passing the hotel on my way home from school when Abner Potts called out to me from the piazza and asked me to bring it. The speaker was a bright, round-faced boy of ten. The boy whom he addressed was five or six years older. Only a week previous he had lost his father, and as the family consisted only of these two, he was left, so far as near relatives were concerned, alone in the world. Immediately after the funeral he had been invited home by Mr. Benjamin Howard, a friend of his father, but in no manner connected with him by ties of relationship. "'You can stay here as long as you like, Harry,' said Mr. Howard kindly. It will take you some time to form your plans, perhaps, and George will be glad to have your company. Thank you, Mr. Howard, said Harry gratefully. Shall you look for some employment here? No, my father has a second cousin in Colebrook, named John Fox. Before he died, he advised me to write to Mr. Fox and go to his home if I should receive an invitation. I hope for your sake he will prove a good man. What is his business? I don't know, nor did my father. All I know is that he is considered a prosperous man. This letter is from him. It was enclosed in a brown envelope and ran as follows. Harry Vane, I have received your letter saying that your father wants me to be your guardian. I don't know as I have any objections. Being a businessman, it will come easy to me, and I think your father was wise to select me. I am ready to receive you any time. You will come to Bolton on the cars. That is eight miles from here, and there's a stage that meets the train. It wouldn't do you any harm to walk, but boys ain't so active as they were in my young days. The stage fare is fifty cents, which I shall expect you to pay yourself if you ride. There is one thing you don't say anything about, how much property your pa left. I hope it is a good round sum, and I will take good care of it for you. Anybody round here will tell you that John Fox is a good man of business, and about as sharp as most people. Mrs. Fox will be glad to see you, and my boy Joel will be glad to have someone to keep him company. He is about sixteen years old. 
You don't say how old you are, but from your letter I surmise that you are as much as that. You will find a happy united family, consisting of me and my wife, Joel, and his sister Sally. Sally is 14, just two years younger than Joel. We live in a comfortable way, but we don't gorge ourselves on rich, unhealthy food. No more at present. Yours to command, John Fox. Harry smiled more than once as he read this letter. Your relative isn't strong on spelling, remarked Mr. Howard, as he laid the letter on the table. No, sir, but he appears to be strong on economy. It's a comfort to know that I shall not be injured by rich, unhealthy food. When do you mean to start for Colebrook? asked Mr. Howard. Tomorrow morning. I've been looking at a railroad guide, and I find it will bring me to Colebrook in time for supper. We should be glad to have you stay with us as long as possible, Harry. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I don't doubt that, but the struggle of life is before me, and I may as well enter upon it at once. At four o'clock in the afternoon, the conductor of the train on which Harry was a passenger called up Bolton. Harry snatched up his carpet bag and made his way to the door, for this was the place where he was to take the train to Colebrook. Two other passengers got out at the same time. One was an elderly man, and the other a young man of twenty-five. They appeared to be father and son, and, as Harry learned afterward, they were engaged in farming. "'Any passengers for Colebrook?' inquired the driver of the old-fashioned Concord stage, which was drawn up beside the platform. "'There's Obed and me,' said the old farmer. "'May I ride on the seat with you?' asked Harry of the driver. "'Certain. Where are you going?' "'To Colebrook. Then this is your team.' Harry climbed up with a boy's activity and sat down on the broad seat, congratulating himself that he would have a chance to see the country and breathe better air than those confined inside. Soon the driver sat down on the box beside him and started on the horses. "'You're a stranger, ain't you?' he remarked, with an inquisitive glance at his young traveling companion. "'Yes, I've never been here before. "'Are you going to the tavern?' "'No, I'm going to the house of Mr. John Fox. "'Do you know him?' "'I reckon everybody around here knows John Fox.' "'I don't know him. He's to be my guardian.' Show sure, you have a queer guardian. Why queer? The fact is, old John will cheat you out of your eye teeth if he gets a chance. He's about the sharpest man around. He can't cheat me out of much, returned Harry, not especially reassured by this remark. What is the business of Mr. Fox? Well, he's got some land, but he makes his living chiefly by trading horses, auctioneering, and such like. What sort of woman is Mrs. Fox? She's a good match for the old man. She's about as mean as he is. Mr. Fox wrote me that he had two children. Yes, there's Joel. He's about your age. He's a chip off the old block, red-headed and freckled, just like the old man. I don't believe Joel ever spent a cent in his life. He hangs on to money as tight as if his life depended on it. There's a girl, too, isn't there? Yep, Sally. She looks like her ma, except she's red-headed like her pa. I'm glad to know something of the family but I'm afraid I shan't enjoy myself very much among the foxes. With such conversation, Harry beguiled the way. On the whole, he enjoyed the ride. There were hills, and here and there the road ran through the woods. He could hear the singing of birds, and, notwithstanding what he had heard, he felt in good spirits. At length, the stage entered the village of Colebrook. It was a village of moderate size, about two hundred houses being scattered around a tract about half a mile square. Occupying a central position was the tavern, a square, two-story building, with the piazza in front, on which was congregated a number of villagers. After rapidly scanning them, the driver said, Do you see that tall man over there leaning against the post? Yes. That's your guardian. That's John Fox himself, as large as life, and just about as homely. End of Facing the World, Chapter 1 Harry Receives a Letter By Horatio Alger, Jr. Génesis capítulo primero de la versión de la Biblia Reina Valera Antigua Esta es una grabación para LibriVox. Todas las grabaciones de LibriVox están en el dominio público. Para más información o para ser voluntario, visite LibriVox.org. Grabado por Claudia Barrett en Houston, Texas. Génesis capítulo primero En el principio... Crió Dios los cielos y la tierra, y la tierra estaba desordenada y vacía, y las tinieblas estaban sobre la haz del abismo, y el Espíritu de Dios se movía sobre la haz de las aguas. 
Y dijo Dios, sea la luz, y fue la luz. Y vio Dios que la luz era buena, y apartó Dios la luz de las tinieblas. Y llamó Dios a la luz día, y a las tinieblas llamó noche. Y fue la tarde y la mañana un día. Y dijo Dios, haya expansión en medio de las aguas, y separe las aguas de las aguas. E hizo Dios la expansión, y apartó las aguas que estaban debajo de la expansión, de las aguas que estaban sobre la expansión, y fue así. Y llamó Dios a la expansión cielos, y fue la tarde y la mañana el día segundo. Y dijo Dios, júntense las aguas que están debajo de los cielos en un lugar, y descúbrase la seca, y fue así. Y llamó Dios a la seca tierra, y a la reunión de las aguas llamó mares. Y vio Dios que era bueno. Y dijo Dios, produzca la tierra hierba verde, hierba que dé simiente, árbol de fruto que dé fruto según su género, que su simiente esté en él sobre la tierra. Y fue así. Y produjo la tierra hierba verde, hierba que da simiente según su naturaleza, y árbol que da fruto, cuya simiente está en él según su género. Y vio Dios que era bueno. Y fue la tarde y la mañana, el día tercero. Y dijo Dios, sean lumbreras en la expansión de los cielos para apartar el día y la noche, y sean por señales, y para las estaciones, y para días y años, y sean por lumbreras en la expansión de los cielos para alumbrar sobre la tierra. Y fue, e hizo Dios las dos grandes lumbreras, la lumbrera mayor para que señorease en el día, y la lumbrera menor para que señorease en la noche. Hizo también las estrellas. Y puso las Dios en la expansión de los cielos para alumbrar sobre la tierra, y para señorear en el día y en la noche, y para apartar la luz y las tinieblas. Y vio Dios que era bueno. Y fue la tarde y la mañana, el día cuarto. Y dijo Dios, Produzcan las aguas reptil de ánima viviente, y aves que vuelen sobre la tierra, en la abierta expansión de los cielos. Y crió Dios las grandes ballenas, y toda cosa viva que anda arrastrando, que las aguas produjeron según su género, y toda ave alada según su especie, y vio Dios que era bueno. Y Dios los bendijo, diciendo, Fructificad y multiplicad, y henchid las aguas en los mares, y las aves se multipliquen en la tierra. Y fue la tarde y la mañana, el día quinto. Y dijo Dios, Produzca la tierra seres vivientes según su género, bestias y serpientes, y animales de la tierra según su especie. Y fue así. E hizo Dios animales de la tierra según su género, y ganado según su género, y todo animal que anda arrastrando sobre la tierra según su especie. Y vio Dios que era bueno. Y dijo Dios, Hagamos al hombre a nuestra imagen, conforme a nuestra semejanza, y señoré en los peces de la mar, y en las aves de los cielos, y en las bestias, y en toda la tierra, y en todo animal que anda arrastrando sobre la tierra. Y crió Dios al hombre a su imagen. A imagen de Dios lo crió, varón y hembra los crió. Y los bendijo Dios, y díjoles Dios, fructificar y multiplicar, y henchid la tierra, y sojuzgadla, y señoread en los peces de la mar, y en las aves de los cielos, y en todas las bestias que se mueven sobre la tierra. Y dijo Dios, He aquí que os he dado toda hierba que da simiente, que está sobre la haz de toda la tierra, y todo árbol en que hay fruto de árbol que da simiente, se los ha para comer. Y a toda bestia de la tierra, y a todas las aves de los cielos, y a todo lo que se mueve sobre la tierra, en que hay vida, toda hierba verde le será para comer. Y fue así. Y vio Dios todo lo que había hecho, y he aquí que era bueno en gran manera. Y fue la tarde y la mañana, el día sexto. Fin de Génesis capítulo primero, grabado por Claudia Barrett en Houston, Texas. A Hazard of New Fortunes, Chapter 1, by William Dean Howells. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Now you think this thing over, March, and let me know the last of next week, said Fulkerson. He got up from the chair which he had been sitting astride, with his face to its back, and tilting toward March on its hind legs, and came and rapped upon his table with his thin bamboo stick. What you want to do is to get out of the insurance business anyway. You acknowledge that yourself. You never liked it. And now it makes you sick. In other words, it's killing you. You ain't an insurance man by nature. You're a natural-born literary man, and you've been going against the grain. Now I offer you a chance to go with the grain. I don't say you're going to make your everlasting fortune, but I'll give you a living salary, and if the thing succeeds, you'll share in its success. We'll all share in its success. That's the beauty of it. I tell you, March, this is the greatest idea that's been struck since... Fulkerson stopped and searched his mind for a fit image. Since the creation of man... He put his leg up over the corner of March's table and gave himself a sharp cut on the thigh, and leaned forward to get the full effect of his words upon his listener. March had his hands clasped together behind his head, and he took one of them down long enough to put his inkstand and mucilage bottle out of Fulkerson's way. After many years' experiment of a moustache and whiskers, he now wore his grizzled beard full, but cropped close. It gave him a certain grimness, corrected by the gentleness of his eyes. Some people don't think much of the creation of man nowadays. Why stop at that? Why not say, since the morning stars sang together? No, sir. No, sir, I don't want to claim too much. And I draw the line at the creation of man. I'm satisfied with that. But if you want to ring the morning stars into the prospectus, all right. I won't go back on you. "'But I don't understand why you've set your mind on me,' March said. "'I haven't had any magazine experience, you know that, "'and I haven't seriously attempted to do anything in literature since I was married. "'I gave up smoking and the muse together. "'I suppose I could still manage a cigar, but I don't believe I could muse worth a cent.' "'Fulkerson took the thought out of his mouth and put it into his own words. "'I know. Well, I don't want you to.' I don't care if you never write a line for the thing, though you needn't reject anything of yours if it happens to be good on that account. And I don't want much experience in my editor. Rather not have it. You told me, didn't you, that you used to do some newspaper work before you settled down? Yes. I thought my lines were permanently cast in those places once. It was more an accident than anything else that I got into the insurance business. I suppose I secretly hoped that if I made my living by something utterly different, I could come more freshly to literature proper in my leisure. I see. And you found the insurance business too many for you. Well, anyway, you've always had a hankering for the ink pots, and the fact that you first gave me the idea of this thing shows that you've done more or less thinking about magazines. Yes, less. Well, all right. Now don't you be troubled. I know what I want, generally speaking, and in this particular instance I want you. I might get a man of more experience, but I should probably get a man of more prejudice and self-conceit along with him, and a man with a following of the literary hangers-on that are sure to get round an editor sooner or later. I want to start fair, and I found out in the syndicate business all the men that are worth having, but they know me, and they don't know you. And that's where we shall have the pull on them. They won't be able to work the thing. Don't you be anxious about the experience. I've got experience enough of my own to run a dozen editors. What I want is an editor who has taste, and you've got it, and conscience, and you've got it, and horse sense, and you've got that. And I like you because you're a Western man, and I'm another. I do cotton to a Western man when I find him off east here holding his own with the best of them, and showing him that he's just as much civilized as they are. We both know what it is to have our bright home in the setting sun, hey? I think we Western men who've come east are apt to take ourselves a little too objectively, and to feel ourselves rather more representative than we need, March remarked. Fulkerson was delighted. You've hit it. We do. We are. And as for holding my own... I'm not very proud of what I've done in that way. It's been very little to hold. 
But I know what you mean, Fulkerson, and I felt the same thing myself. It warmed me toward you when we first met. I can't help suffusing a little to any man when I hear that he was born on the other side of the Alleghenies. It's perfectly stupid. I despise the same thing when I see it in Boston people. Fulkerson pulled first one of his blond whiskers and then the other, and twisted the end of each into a point, which he left to untwine itself. He fixed March with his little eyes, which had a curious innocence in their cunning, and tapped the desk immediately in front of him. What I like about you is that you're broad in your sympathies. The first time I saw you, that night on the Quebec boat, I said to myself, there's a man I want to know. There's a human being. I was a little afraid of Mrs. March and the children, but I felt at home with you, thoroughly domesticated, before I passed a word with you. And when you spoke first, and opened up with a joke over that fellow's tableful of light literature, and Indian moccasins, and birch bark toy canoes, and stereoscopic views, I knew that we were brothers spiritual, twins. I recognized the Western style of fun, and I thought when you said you were from Boston that it was some of the same. But I see now that it's being a cold fact, as far as the last fifteen or twenty years count, is just so much gain. You know both sections, and you can make this thing go, from ocean to ocean. We might ring that into the prospectus too, March suggested with a smile. You might call the thing from sea to sea. By the way, what are you going to call it? I haven't decided yet. That's one of the things I wanted to talk with you about. I had thought of the syndicate, but it sounds kind of dry and doesn't seem to cover the ground exactly. I should like something that would express the cooperative character of the thing, but I don't know as I can get it. Might call it the mutual. They'd think it was an insurance paper. No, that won't do. But mutual comes pretty near the idea. If we could get something like that, it would pique curiosity. And then, if we could get paragraphs afloat, explaining that the contributors were to be paid according to the sales, it would be a first-rate ad. He bent a wide, anxious, inquiring smile upon March, who suggested lazily, You might call it the round robin. That would express the central idea of irresponsibility. As I understand, everybody is to share the profits and be exempt from the losses. Or, if I'm wrong and the reverse is true, you might call it the army of martyrs. Come, that sounds attractive, Fulkerson. Or what do you think of the fifth wheel? That would forestall the criticism that there are too many literary periodicals already. Or, if you want to put forward the idea of complete independence, you could call it the freelance. Or, or the hog on ice. Either stand up or fall down, you know, Fulkerson broke in coarsely. But we'll leave the name of the magazine till we get the editor. I see the poisons beginning to work in your march, and if I had time, I'd leave the result to time. But I haven't. I've got to know inside of the next week. To come down to business with you, March, I shan't start this thing unless I can get you to take hold of it. He seemed to expect some acknowledgment, and March said, Well, that's very nice of you, Fulkerson. No, sir. No, sir. I've always liked you and wanted you ever since we met that first night. I had this thing inchoately in my mind then, when I was telling you about the newspaper syndicate business beautiful vision of a lot of literary fellows breaking loose from the bondage of publishers and playing it alone. You might call it the lone hand. That would be attractive, March interrupted. The whole West would know what you meant. Fulkerson was talking seriously, and March was listening seriously, but they both broke off and laughed. Fulkerson got down off the table and made some turns about the room. It was growing late, the October sun had left the top of the tall windows. It was still clear day, but it would soon be twilight. They had been talking a long time. Fulkerson came and stood with his little feet wide apart and bent his little lean square face on March. See here, how much do you get out of this thing here anyway? The insurance business? March hesitated a moment and then said with a certain effort of reserve, At present about three thousand. He looked up at Fulkerson with a glance, as if he had a mind to enlarge upon the fact, and then dropped his eyes without saying more. Whether Fulkerson had not thought it so much or not, he said, 
Well, I'll give you thirty-five hundred. Come, and your chances in the success. We won't count the chances in the success, and I don't believe thirty-five hundred would go any further in New York than three thousand in Boston. But you don't live on three thousand here. No, my wife has a little property. Well, she won't lose the income if you go to New York. I suppose you pay ten or twelve hundred a year for your house here. You can get plenty of flats in New York for the same money. And I understand you can get all sorts of provisions for less than you pay now. Three or four cents on the pound. Come. This was by no means the first talk they had had about the matter. Every three or four months during the past two years, the syndicate man had dropped in upon March to air the scheme and to get his impressions of it. This had happened so often that it had come to be a sort of joke between them. But now Fulkerson clearly meant business, and March had a struggle to maintain himself in a firm poise of refusal. I dare say it wouldn't, or it needn't, cost so very much more. But I don't want to go to New York, or my wife doesn't. It's the same thing. A good deal samer, Fulkerson admitted. March did not quite like his candor, and he went on with dignity. It's very natural she shouldn't. She has always lived in Boston. She's attached to the place. Now, if you were going to start the fifth wheel in Boston... Fulkerson slowly and sadly shook his head, but decidedly. Wouldn't do. You might as well say St. Louis or Cincinnati. There's only one city that belongs to the whole country, and that's New York. Yes, I know, sighed March, and Boston belongs to the Bostonians. But they like you to make yourself at home while you're visiting. If you'll agree to make phrases like that right along and get them into the round robin somehow, I'll say four thousand, said Fulkerson. You think it over now, March. You talk it over with Mrs. March. I know you will, anyway and I might as well make a virtue of advising you to do it. Tell her I advised you to do it, and you let me know before next Saturday what you've decided. March shut down the rolling top of his desk in the corner of the room and walked Fulkerson out before him. It was so late that the last of the chorewomen who washed down the marble halls and stairs of the great building had wrung out her floor cloth and departed, leaving spotless stone and a clean, damp smell in the darkening corridors behind her. "'Couldn't offer you such swell quarters in New York, Marge,' Fulkerson said, as he went tack-tacking down the steps with his small boot heels. "'But I've got my eye on a little house round in West 11th Street that I'm going to fit up for my bachelor's hall in the third story and adapt for the lone hand in the first and second, if this thing goes through. And I guess we'll be pretty comfortable. It's right on the sand strip. No malaria of any kind.' I don't know that I'm going to share its salubrity with you yet, March sighed, in an obvious travail which gave Fulkerson hopes. Oh, yes, you are, he coaxed. Now you talk it over with your wife. You give her a fair, unprejudiced chance at the thing on its merits. And I'm very much mistaken in Mrs. March if she doesn't tell you to go in and win. We're bound to win. They stood on the outside steps of the vast edifice, beetling like a granite crag above them with the stone groups of an allegory of life insurance foreshortened in the bas-relief overhead. March absently lifted his eyes to it. It was suddenly strange after so many years' familiarity, and so was the well-known street in its Saturday evening solitude. He asked himself, with prophetic homesickness, if it were an omen of what was to be. But he only said, musingly, A fortnightly. You know that didn't work in England. The fortnightly is published once a month now. It works in France, Fulkerson retorted. The Revue des Deux Mondes is still published twice a month. I guess we can make it work in America. With illustrations. Going to have illustrations? My dear boy, what are you giving me? Do I look like the sort of lunatic who would start a thing in the twilight of the 19th century without illustrations? Come off. Ah, that complicates it. I don't know anything about art. March's look of discouragement confessed the hold the scheme had taken upon him. I don't want you to, Fulkerson retorted. Don't you suppose I shall have an art man? And will they, the artists, work at a reduced rate too, like the writers, with the hopes of a share in the success? Of course they will. 
and if I want any particular man for a card, I'll pay him big money besides, but I can get plenty of first-rate sketches on my own terms. You'll see, they'll pour in. Look here, Fulkerson, said March, you'd better call this fortnightly of yours the madness of the half-moon, or bedlam broke loose wouldn't be bad. Why do you throw away all your hard earnings on such a crazy venture? Don't do it. The kindness which March had always felt, in spite of his wife's first misgivings and reservations, for the merry, hopeful, slangy, energetic little creature trembled in his voice. They had both formed a friendship for Fulkerson during the week they were together in Quebec. When he was not working the newspapers there, he went about with them over the familiar ground they were showing their children and was simply grateful for the chance, as well as very entertaining about it all. The children liked him, too. When they got the clue to his intention, and found that he was not quite serious in many of the things he said, they thought he was great fun. They were always glad when their father brought him home, on the occasion of Fulkerson's visits to Boston, and Mrs. March, though of a charier hospitality, welcomed Fulkerson with a grateful sense of his admiration for her husband. He had a way of treating March with deference, as an older and abler man, and of qualifying the freedom he used toward everyone with an implication that March tolerated it voluntarily, which she thought very sweet and even refined. Ah, now you're talking like a man and a brother, said Fulkerson. Why, March, old man, do you suppose I'd come on here and try to talk you into this thing if I wasn't morally? if i wasn't perfectly sure of success there isn't any if or and about it i know my ground every inch and i don't stand alone on it he added with a significance which did not escape march when you've made up your mind i can give you the proof but i'm not at liberty now to say anything more i tell you it's going to be a triumphal march from the word go with coffee and lemonade for the procession along the whole line. All you've got to do is to fall in. He stretched out his hand to March. You let me know as soon as you can. March deferred taking his hand till he could ask, Where are you going? Parker House. Take the eleven for New York tonight. I thought I might walk your way, March looked at his watch, but I shouldn't have time. Goodbye. He now let Fulkerson have his hand, and they exchanged a cordial pressure. Fulkerson started away at a quick, light pace. Half a block off, he stopped, turned round, and, seeing March still standing where he had left him, he called back, joyously, I've got the name! What? Every other week! It isn't bad! Ta-ta! End of A Hazard of New Fortunes, Chapter 1, by William Dean Howells. The Book of John, Chapter 1, by John the Apostle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia Barrett, Houston, Texas. John Chapter 1 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. 
but as many as receive him. To them gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed, and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am coming baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God! And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and said unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and said unto him, 
We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than this. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. End of John chapter 1 by John the Apostle Recording by Claudia Barrett in Houston, Texas Chapter 1 of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alison Valdes. Chapter 1 Introductory Concerning the Pedigree of the Chuzzlewit Family. As no lady or gentleman with any claims to polite breeding can possibly sympathise with the Chuzzlewit family without being first assured of the extreme antiquity of the race, it is a great satisfaction to know that it undoubtedly descended in a direct line from Adam and Eve, and was, in the very earliest times, closely connected with the agricultural interest. If it should ever be urged by grudging and malicious persons that a Chuzzlewit, in any period of the family history, displayed an overweening amount of family pride, surely the weakness will be considered not only pardonable but laudable, when the immense superiority of the house to the rest of mankind in respect of this its ancient origin is taken into account. It is remarkable that, as there was in the oldest family of which we have any record, a murderer and a vagabond, we never fail to meet in the records of all old families with innumerable repetitions of the same phase of character. Indeed, it may be laid down as a general principle that the more extended the ancestry, the greater the amount of violence and vagabondism. For in ancient days those two amusements, combining a wholesome excitement with a promising means of repairing shattered fortunes, were at once the ennobling pursuit and the healthful recreation of the quality of this land. Consequently, it is a source of inexpressible comfort and happiness to find that in various periods of our history the Chuzzlewits were actively connected with diverse slaughterous conspiracies and bloody frays. It is further recorded of them that being clad from head to heel in steel of proof, they did on many occasions lead their leather jerkin soldiers to the death with invincible courage, and afterwards return home gracefully to their relations and friends. There can be no doubt that at least one Chuzzlewit came over with William the Conqueror. It does not appear that this illustrious ancestor came over that monarch to employ the vulgar phrase at any subsequent period inasmuch as the family do not seem to have been ever greatly distinguished by the possession of landed estate and it is well known that for the bestowal of that kind of property upon his favourites the liberality and gratitude of the norman were as remarkable as those virtues are usually found to be in great men when they give away what belongs to other people Perhaps, in this place, the history may pause to congratulate itself upon the enormous amount of bravery, wisdom, eloquence, virtue, gentle birth, and true nobility that appears to have come into England with the Norman invasion, an amount which the genealogy of every ancient family lended its aid to swell, and which would, beyond all question, have been found to be just as great and to the full as prolific in giving birth to long lines of chivalrous descendants boastful of their origin even though william the conqueror had been william the conquered 
a change of circumstances which, it is quite certain, would have made no manner of difference in this respect. There was unquestionably a Chuzzlewit in the gunpowder plot, if indeed the arch-traitor Fawkes himself were not a scion of this remarkable stock, as he might easily have been, supposing another Chuzzlewit to have emigrated to Spain in the previous generation, and there intermarried with a Spanish lady, by whom he had issue one olive-complexioned son. This probable conjecture is strengthened, if not absolutely confirmed, by a fact which cannot fail to be interesting to those who are curious in tracing the progress of hereditary tastes through the lives of their unconscious inheritors. It is a notable circumstance that in these later times many Chuzzlewits, being unsuccessful in other pursuits, have, without the smallest rational hope of enriching themselves, or any conceivable reason, set up as coal merchants, and have, month after month, continued gloomily to watch a small stock of coals, without in any one instance negotiating with a purchaser. The remarkable similarity between this course of proceeding and that adopted by their great ancestor between the vaults of Parliament House at Westminster is too obvious and too full of interest to stand in need of comment. It is also clearly proved by the oral traditions of the family that there existed, at some one period of its history which is not distinctly stated, a matron of such destructive principles, and so familiarized to the use and composition of inflammatory and combustible engines, that she was called the Matchmaker, by which nickname and byword she is recognized in the family legends to this day. Surely there can be no reasonable doubt that this was the Spanish lady, the mother of Chuzzlewit Fawkes. But there is one other piece of evidence, bearing immediate reference to their close connection with this memorable event in English history, which must carry conviction even to a mind, if such a mind there be, remaining unconvinced by these presumptive proofs. There was, within a few years, in the possession of a highly respectable and in every way credible and unimpeachable member of the Chuzzlewit family, for his bitterest enemy never dared to hint at his being otherwise than a wealthy man, a dark lantern of undoubted antiquity, rendered still more interesting by being, in shape and pattern, extremely like such as are in use at the present day. Now this gentleman, since deceased, was at all times ready to make oath, and did, again and again, set forth upon his solemn asseveration, that he had frequently heard his grandmother say, when contemplating this venerable relic, "'Ay, ay, this was carried by my fourth son on the 5th of November, when he was a Guy Fawkes.' These remarkable words wrought, as well they might, a strong impression on his mind, and he was in the habit of repeating them very often." The just interpretation which they bear, and the conclusion to which they lead, are triumphant and irresistible. The old lady, naturally strong-minded, was nevertheless frail and fading. She was notoriously subject to that confusion of ideas, or to say the least of speech, to which age and garrulity are liable. The slight, the very slight, confusion, apparent in these expressions, is manifest and is ludicrously easy of correction. Ay, ay, quoth she, and it will be observed that no emendation whatever is necessary to be made to these two initiative remarks. Ay, ay, this lantern was carried by my forefather, not fourth son, which is preposterous, on the 5th of November, and he was Guy Fawkes. Here we have a remark at once consistent, clear, natural, and in strict accordance with the character of the speaker. Indeed, the anecdote is so plainly susceptible of this meaning, and no other, that it would be hardly worth recording in its original state, were it not a proof of what it may be, and very often is, affected not only in historical prose, but in imaginative poetry, by the exercise of a little ingenious labour on the part of a commentator. It has been said that there is no instance in modern times of a Chuzzlewit having been found on terms of intimacy with the great. But here again the sneering detractors who weave such miserable figments from their malicious brains are stricken dumb by evidence. For letters are yet in the possession of various branches of the family, from which it distinctly appears, being stated in so many words, that one at Diggory Chuzzlewit was in the habit of perpetually dining with Duke Humphrey. 
So constantly was he a guest at that nobleman's table indeed, and so unceasingly were his grace's hospitality and companionship forced, as it were, upon him, that we find him uneasy and full of constraint and reluctance, writing his friends to the effect that if they fail to do so and so by bearer, he will have no choice but to dine again with Duke Humphrey, and expressing himself in a very marked and extraordinary manner, as one surfeited of high life and gracious company. It has been rumoured, and it is needless to say the rumour originated in the same base quarters, that a certain male Chuzzlewit, whose birth must be admitted to be involved in some obscurity, was of very mean and low descent. How stands the proof? When the son of that individual, to whom the secret of his father's birth was supposed to have been communicated by his father in his lifetime, lay upon his deathbed, this question was put to him in a distinct, solemn, and formal way. Toby Chuzzlewit, who was your grandfather? To which he, with his last breath, no less distinctly, solemnly, and formally replied, and his words were taken down at the time and signed by six witnesses, each with his name and address in full, the Lord knows zoo. It may be said, it has been said, for human wickedness has no limits, that there is no lord of that name, and that among the titles which have become extinct, none at all resembling this, in sound even, is to be discovered. But what is the irresistible inference? Rejecting a theory broached by some well-meaning but mistaken persons that this is Mr. Toby Chuzzlewit's grandfather, to judge from his name, must surely have been a mandarin, which is wholly insupportable, for there is no pretence of his grandmother ever having been out of this country, or of any Mandarin having been in it within some years of his father's birth, except those in the tea-shops, which cannot for a moment be regarded as having any bearing on the question one way or other. Rejecting this hypothesis, is it not manifest that Mr. Toby Chuzzlewit had either received the name imperfectly from his father, or that he had forgotten it, or that he had mispronounced it? and that even at the recent period in question the Chuzzlewits were connected by a bend sinister, or kind of heraldic over the left, with some unknown noble and illustrious house? From documentary evidence yet preserved in the family, the fact is clearly established that in the comparatively modern days of the Diggory Chuzzlewit before mentioned, one of its members had attained to a very great wealth and influence. Throughout such fragments of his correspondence as have escaped the ravages of the moths, who, in right of their extensive absorption of the contents of deeds and papers, may be called the general registers of the insect world, we find him making constant reference to an uncle, in respect of whom he would seem to have entertained great expectations, as he was in the habit of seeking to propitiate his favour by presents of plate, jewels, books, watches, and other valuable articles. Thus he writes on one occasion to his brother in reference to a gravy spoon, the brother's property, which he, Diggory, would appear to have borrowed or otherwise possessed himself of. Do not be angry, I have parted with it to my uncle. On another occasion he expresses himself in a similar manner with regard to a child's mug, which had been entrusted to him to get repaired. On another occasion he says, I have bestowed upon that irresistible uncle of mine everything I ever possessed and that he was in the habit of paying long and constant visits to this gentleman at his mansion, if indeed he did not wholly reside there, is manifest from the following sentence. With the exception of the suit of clothes I carry about with me, the whole of my wearing apparel is at present at my uncle's. This gentleman's patronage and influence must have been very extensive, for his nephew writes, His interest is too high, it is too much, it is tremendous, and the like. Still it does not appear, which is strange, to have procured for him any lucrative post at court or elsewhere, or to have conferred upon him any other distinction than that which was necessarily included in the countenance of so great a man, and the being invited by him to certain entertainments, so splendid and costly in their nature, that he calls them golden balls. It is needless to multiply instances of the high and lofty station, and the vast importance of the Chuzzlewits at different periods. If it came within the scope of reasonable probability that further proofs were required, they might be heaped upon each other until they formed an alps of testimony, beneath which the boldest scepticism should be crushed and beaten flat. 
as a goodly tumulus is already collected and decently battened up above the family grave the present chapter is content to leave it as it is merely adding by way of a final spadeful that many chuzzlewits both male and female are proved to demonstration on the faith of letters written by their own mothers to have had chiselled noses undeniable chins forms that might have served the sculptor for a model exquisitely turned limbs and polished foreheads of so transparent a texture that the blue veins might be seen branching off in various directions like so many roads on an ethereal map this fact in itself though it had been a solitary one would have utterly settled and clenched the business in hand for it is well known on the authority of all the books which treat of such matters that every one of these phenomena but especially that of the chiselling are invariably peculiar to and only make themselves apparent in persons of the very best condition this history having to its own perfect satisfaction and consequently to the full contentment of all its readers proved the chuzzlewits to have had an origin and to have at one time or other of an importance which cannot fail to render them highly improving and acceptable acquaintance to all right-minded individuals may now proceed in earnest with its task and having shown that they must have had by reason of their ancient birth a pretty large share in the foundation and increase of the human family it will one day become its province to submit that such of its members as shall be introduced in these pages have still many counterparts and prototypes in the great world about us at present it contents itself with remarking in a general way on this head firstly that it may be safely asserted and yet without implying any direct participation in the mombodo doctrine touching the probability of the human race having once been monkeys that men do play very strange and extraordinary tricks secondly and yet without trenching the blumenbach theory as to the descendants of adam having a vast number of qualities which belong more particularly to swine than to any other class of animals in the creation that some men certainly are remarkable for taking uncommon good care of themselves End of chapter one le mort d'arthur book one chapter one by Sir Thomas Mallory. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dom Bombadil. Book One, Chapter One of Le Mort d'Arthur. How Uther Pendragon sent for the Duke of Cornwall and Ygraine his wife, and of their departing suddenly again. It befell in the days of Uther Pendragon that he was king of all England, and so reigned that there was a mighty duke in Cornwall that held war against him long time, and the duke was called the Duke of Tintagel. And so by means King Uther sent for this duke, charging him to bring his wife with him, for she was called a fair lady and a passing wise, and her name was called Igraine. So when the duke and his wife were come unto the king, by the means of great lords they were accorded both. The king liked and loved this lady well, and he made them great cheer out of measure, and desired to have lain by her. But she was a passing good woman, and would not assent unto the king. And then she told the duke her husband, and said, I suppose that we were sent for that I should be dishonoured. Wherefore, husband, I counsel you that we depart from hence suddenly, that we may ride all night unto our own castle and in likewise as she said so they departed that neither the king nor none of his council were aware of their departing all so soon as king uther knew of their departing so suddenly he was wonderly wroth then he called to him his privy council and told them of the sudden departing of the duke and his wife then they advised the king to send for the duke and his wife by a great charge and if he will not come at your summons then may ye do your best, then have ye cause to make mighty war upon him. So that was done, and the messengers had their answers, and that was this shortly, that neither he nor his wife would not come at him. Then was the king wonderly wroth, and then the king sent him plain word again, and bade him be ready, and stuff him, and garnish him, for within forty days he would fetch him out of the biggest castle that he hath. 
When the Duke had this warning, anon he went and furnished and garnished two strong castles of his, of the which the one hight Tintagel, and the other castle hight Terrabil. So his wife, Dame Crane, he put in the castle of Tintagel, and himself he put in the castle of Terrabil, the which had many issues and posterns out. Then in all haste came Uther with a great host, and laid a siege about the castle of Terrabil. And there he pied many pavilions, and there was great war made on both parties, and much people slain. And for pure anger, and for great love of fairy grain, the King Uther fell sick. So came to the King Uther Sir Alpheus, a noble knight, and asked the king why he was sick. I shall tell thee, said the king, I am sick for anger and for love of fairy grain, that I may not be whole. Well, my lord, said Sir Alpheus, I shall seek Merlin, and he shall do you remedy, that your heart shall be pleased. So Alpheus departed, and by adventure he met Merlin in a beggar's array, and there Merlin asked Alpheus whom he sought, and he said he had little ado to tell him. Well, said Merlin, I know whom you seekest, for thou seekest Merlin, therefore seek no farther, for I am here. And if King Uther will well reward me, and be sworn unto me to fulfill my desire, that shall be his honour and profit more than mine, for I shall cause him to have all his desire. All this I will undertake, said Alpheus, but there shall be nothing reasonable, but thou shalt have thy desire. Well, said Merlin, he shall have his intent and desire. And therefore, said Merlin, ride on your way, for I will not be long behind. End of Book One, Chapter One of Le Mort d'Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory. Recording by Dom Bombadil. Paul Clifford, Chapter One by Edward Bulwer Lytton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Say, ye oppressed by some fantastic woes, some jarring nerve that baffles your repose, who press the downy couch while slaves advance with timid eye to read the distant glance, who with sad prayers the weary doctor tease to name the nameless, ever new disease, who with mock patience dire complaints endure, which real pain and that alone can cure, how would you bear in real pain to lie despised, neglected, left alone to die? How would you bear to draw your last breath, where all that's wretched paves the way to death? Crab. It was a dark and stormy night. The rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals, when it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets, for it is in London that our scene lies, rattling along the housetops and fiercely agitating the scanty flame of the lamps that struggled against the darkness. Through one of the obscurest quarters of London, and among haunts little loved by the gentlemen of the police, a man, evidently of the lowest orders, was wending his solitary way. He stopped twice or thrice at different shops and houses of a description correspondent with the appearance of the quarter in which they were situated, and tended inquiry for some article or another which did not seem easily to be met with. All the answers he received were couched in the negative, and as he turned from each door he muttered to himself, if no very elegant phraseology, his disappointment and discontent. At length, at one house, the landlord, a sturdy butcher, after rendering the same reply the inquirer had hitherto received, added, But if this will do as well, dummy, it is quite at your service. Pausing reflectively for a moment, dummy responded that he thought the thing proffered might do as well, and thrusting it into his ample pocket, he strode away with as rapid a motion as the wind and the rain would allow. He soon came to a nest of low and dingy buildings, at the entrance to which, in half-effaced characters, was written, Thames Court. Halting at the most conspicuous of these buildings, an inn or alehouse, 
through the half-closed windows of which blazed out in ruddy comfort the beams of the hospitable hearth, he knocked hastily at the door. He was admitted by a lady of a certain age, and endowed with a comely rotundity of face and person. "'Has got it, dummy,' she said, quickly, as she closed the door upon the guest. "'Noah, Noah, not exactly. But I thinks as how—' "'Pish, you fool!' cried the woman, interrupting him peevishly. "'Vy, it is no use deceiving me. You know you has only stepped from my boozing ken to another, and you has not been at her the book at all. So there's the poor creature a raven and dying, and you—' "'Let I speak!' interrupted Dummy, in his turn. "'I tells you, I vent first to Mother Busblones, who, I knows, chops the winers this morning and evening to the young lady. And I axes there for a Bible, and she says, says she, I, as only a companion to the halter. But you'll get a Bible, I think, at Master Tolkien's. The cobbler as preaches. So I goes to Master Tolkien's, and he says, says he, I is no call for the Bible. Cause vi? I as a call without. But mayhap you'll be getting it at the butcher's, hover the vey. Cause vi? The butcher'll be damned. So I goes hover the vey, and the butcher says, says he, I is not a Bible. But I as a book of plays bound for all the world just likin, and mayhap the poor creature mayn't see the difference. So I takes the plays, Mrs. Marjorie, and here they be, surely, and how's poor Judy? Fearsome, she'll not be over the night, I am a thinkin. Vell, I'll track up the dancers. So saying, Dummy ascended a doorless staircase, across the entrance of which a blanket, stretched angularly from the wall to the chimney, afforded a kind of screen, and presently he stood within a chamber which the dark and painful genius of Crab might have delighted to portray. The walls were whitewashed, and at sundry places strange figures and grotesque characters had been traced by some mirthful inmate in such sable outline as the end of a smoked stick or the edge of a piece of charcoal is wont to produce. The wan and flickering light afforded by a farthing candle gave a sort of grimness and menace to these achievements of pictorial art, especially as they more than once received embellishments from portraits of Satan such as he is accustomed to be drawn. A low fire burned gloomily in the sooty grate, and on the hob hissed, in the still small voice, of an iron kettle. On a round deal table were two vials, a cracked cup, a broken spoon of some dull metal, and upon two or three mutilated chairs were scattered various articles of female attire. On another table, placed below a high, narrow, shutterless casement, a thwart which, instead of a curtain, a checked apron had been loosely hung, and now waved fitfully to and fro in the gusts of wind that made easy ingress through many a chink and cranny, were a looking-glass, sundry appliances of the toilet, a box of coarse rouge, a few ornaments of more show than value, and a watch, the regular and calm click of which produced that indescribably painful feeling which, we fear, many of our readers who have heard the sound in a sick chamber can easily recall. A large tester bed stood opposite to this table, and the looking-glass partially reflected curtains of a faded stripe, and ever and anon, as the position of the sufferer followed the restless emotion of a disordered mind, glimpses of the face of one on whom death was rapidly hastening. Beside this bed now stood Dummy, a small, thin man dressed in a tattered plush jerkin, from which the raindrops slowly dripped, with a thin, yellow, cunning physiognomy, grotesquely hideous in feature, but not positively villainous in expression. On the other side of the bed stood a little boy of about three years old, dressed as if belonging to the better classes, although the garb was somewhat tattered and discolored. The poor child trembled violently and evidently looked with a feeling of relief on the entrance of Dummy. And now there slowly, with many a phthisical sigh, heaved towards the foot of the bed, the heavy frame of the woman who had accosted Dummy below, and had followed him, hod passibus aqueus, to the room of the sufferer. She stood with a bottle of medicine in her hand, shaking its contents up and down, and with a kindly yet timid compassion spread over a countenance crimsoned with habitual libations. This made the scene save that on a chair by the bedside lay a profusion of long, glossy, golden ringlets, which had been cut from the head of the sufferer when the fever had begun to mount upwards, but which, 
with the jealousy that betrayed the darling littleness of a vain heart she had seized and insisted on retaining near her and save that by the fire perfectly inattentive to the event about to take place within the chamber and to which we of the biped race attach so awful an importance lay a large grey cat curled in a ball and dozing with half-shut eyes and ears that now and then denoted by general inflection the jar of a louder or nearer sound than usual upon her lethargic senses the dying woman did not at first attend to the entrance either of dummy or the female at the foot of the bed but she turned herself round towards the child and grasping his arm fiercely she drew him towards her and gazed on his terrified features with a look in which exhaustion and an exceeding wanness of complexion were even horribly contrasted by the glare and energy of delirium if you are like him she muttered i will strangle you i will i tremble you ought to tremble when your mother touches you or when he is mentioned you have his eyes you have out with them out the devil sits laughing in them oh you weep do you little one well now be still my love be hushed i would not harm thee harm oh god he is my child after all at these words she clasped the boy passionately to her breast and burst into tears Coom now coom said dummy soothingly take the stuff judith and then we'll talk over the hurchin the mother relaxed her grasp of the boy and turning toward the speaker gazed at him for some moments with a bewildered stare at length she appeared slowly to remember him and said as she raised herself in one hand and pointed the other towards him with an inquiring gesture, thou hast brought the book dummy answered by lifting up the book he had brought from the honest butchers clear the room then said the sufferer with that air of mock command so common to the insane we would be alone dummy winked at the good woman at the foot of the bed and she though generally no easy person to order or persuade left without reluctance the sick chamber if she be a going to pray murmured our landlady for that office did the good matron hold i may indeed as well take myself off for it's not weary comfortable like to those who be old to hear all that ear with this pious reflection the hostess of the mug so was the hostelry called heavily descended the creaking stairs now man said the sufferer sternly swear that you will never reveal swear i say and by the great god whose angels are about this night if ever you break the oath i will come back and haunt you to your dying day dummy's face grew pale for he was superstitiously affected by the vehemence and the language of the dying woman and he answered as he kissed the pretended bible that he swore to keep the secret as much as he knew of it which she must be sensible he said was very little as he spoke the wind swept with a loud and sudden gust down the chimney and shook the roof above them so violently as to loosen many of the crumbling tiles which fell one after the other with a crashing noise on the pavement below dummy started in a fright and perhaps his conscience smoke him for the trick he had played with regard to the false bible but the woman whose excited and unstrung nerves led her astray from one subject to another with preternatural celerity said with a hysterical laugh see dummy they come in state for me give me the cap yonder and bring the looking-glass dummy obeyed and the woman as she in a low tone uttered something about the unbecoming color of the ribbons adjusted the cap on her head and then saying in a regretful and petulant voice why should they have cut off my hair such a disfigurement bade dummy desire mrs marjorie once more to ascend to her left alone with her child the face of the wretched mother softened as she regarded him and all the levities and all the vehemences if we may use the word which in the turbulent commotion of her delirium had been stirred upward to the surface of her mind gradually now sank as death increased upon her and a mother's anxiety rose to the natural level from which it had been disturbed and abased she took the child to her bosom and clasping him in her arms which grew weaker with every instant she soothed him with the sort of chant which nurses sing over their untoward infants but her voice was cracked and hollow and as she felt it was so the mother's eyes filled with tears mrs marjorie now re-entered 
and turning towards the hostess with an impressive calmness of manner which astonished and awed the person she addressed, the dying woman pointed to the child and said, "'You have been kind to me, very kind, and may God bless you for it. I have found that those whom the world calls the worst are often the most human. But I am not going to thank you as I ought to do, but to ask of you a last and exceeding favor. Protect my child till he grows up. You have often said you loved him. You are childless yourself, and a morsel of bread and a shelter for the night, which is all I ask you to give to him, will not impoverish more legitimate claimants. Poor Mrs. Marjorie, fairly sobbing, vowed she would be a mother to the child, and that she would endeavor to rear him honestly, though a public house was not, she confessed, the best place for good examples. "'Take him,' cried the mother, hoarsely, as her voice, failing her strength, rattled indistinctly, and almost died within her. "'Take him. Rear him as you will, as you can. Any example, any roof, better than—' Here the words were inaudible. "'And, oh, may it be a curse and a—' "'Give me the medicine. I am dying.' The hostess, alarmed, hastened to comply, but before she returned to the bedside, the sufferer was insensible, nor did she again recover speech or motion. A low and rare moan only testified continued life, and within two hours that ceased and the spirit was gone. At that time our good hostess was herself beyond the things of this outer world, having supported her spirits during the vigils of the whole night, with so many a little liquid stimulants that they finally sank into that torpor which generally succeeds excitement. Taking, perhaps, advantage of the opportunity which the insensibility of the hostess afforded him, Dummy, by the expiring ray of the candle that burned in the death chamber, hastily opened a huge box, which was generally concealed under the bed and contained the wardrobe of the deceased, and turned with irreverent hand over the linens and the silks, until quite at the bottom of the trunk he discovered some packets of letters. These he seized, and buried in the conveniences of his dress. He then, rising and replacing the box, cast a longing eye toward the watch on the toilet table, which was of gold, but he withdrew his gaze and with a querulous sigh observed to himself, the old bloke in kens of that, odd ratter. But, howsoever, I'll take this, who knows but it may be of sarvice. Tanny's to-day may be smashed to-morrow. Meaning, of what is no value to-day may be precious hereafter, and he laid his coarse hand on the golden and silky tresses which we have described. "'Tis a rum business, and puzzles I, but mum's the word for my own little coal corn." With this brief soliloquy, Dummy descended the stairs and let himself out of the house. End of Paul Clifford, Chapter 1 By Edward Bulwer-Lytton Peter Simple, Chapter 1 by Frederick Marriott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. The Great Advantage of Being the Fool of the Family. My destiny is decided, and I am consigned to a stockbroker as part of His Majesty's sea stock. Unfortunately for me, Mr. Handycock is a bear, and I get very little dinner. If I cannot narrate a life of adventurous and daring exploits, fortunately I have no heavy crimes to confess, and if I do not rise in the estimation of the reader for acts of gallantry and devotion in my country's cause, at least I may claim the merit of zealous and persevering continuance in my vocation. We are, all of us, variously gifted from above, and he who is content to walk, instead of to run, on his allotted path through life, although he may not so rapidly attain the goal, has the advantage of not being out of breath upon his arrival. As well as I can recollect and analyze my early propensities, I think that, had I been permitted to select my own profession, I should in all probability have bound myself apprentice to a tailor, for I always envied the comfortable seat which they appeared to enjoy upon the shop-board, and their elevated position, which enabled them to look down upon the constant succession of the idle or the busy, who passed in review before them in the main street of the country town, near to which I passed the first fourteen years of my existence. 
but my father who was a clergyman of the church of england and the youngest brother of a noble family had a lucrative living and a soul above buttons if his son had not it has been from time immemorial the heathenish custom to sacrifice the greatest fool of the family to the prosperity and naval superiority of the country and at the age of fourteen i was selected as the victim if the custom be judicious i had no reason to complain there was not one dissentient voice when it was proposed before all the varieties of my aunts and cousins invited to partake of our new year's festival i was selected by general acclamation flattered by such an unanimous acknowledgment of my qualification i felt a slight degree of military ardor and a sort of vision of future grandeur passed before me in the distant vista of which i perceived a coach with four horses and a service of plate but as my story is not a very short one i must not dwell too long on its commencement i shall therefore inform the reader that my father who lived in the north of england did not think it right to fit me out at the country town near to which we resided but about a fortnight after the decision which i have referred to he forwarded me to london on the outside of the coach with my best suit of bottle green and six shirts to prevent mistakes i was booked in the waybill to be delivered to mr thomas handicock number fourteen st clement's lane carriage paid my parting with the family was very affecting my mother cried bitterly for like all mothers she liked the greatest fool which she had presented to my father better than all the rest my sisters cried because my mother cried tom roared for a short time more loudly than all the rest having been chastised by my father for breaking his fourth window in that week at last i tore myself away i had blubbered till my eyes were so red and swollen that the pupils were scarcely to be distinguished and tears and dirt had veined my cheeks like the marble of the chimney-piece my handkerchief was soaked through with wiping my eyes and blowing my nose before the scene was over my brother tom with a kindness which did honour to his heart exchanged his for mine saying with fraternal regard here peter take mine it's as dry as a bone but my father would not wait for a second handkerchief to perform its duty he led me away through the hall when having shaken hands with all the men and kissed all the maids who stood in a row with their aprons to their eyes i quitted the paternal roof the coachman accompanied me to the stage having seen me securely wedged between two fat old women and having put my parcel inside he took his leave and in a few minutes i was on my road to london i was too much depressed to take notice of anything during my journey when we arrived in london they drove to the blue boar in a street the name of which i have forgotten i had never seen or heard of such an animal and certainly it did appear very formidable its mouth was open and teeth very large the coachman threw his whip to the ostler and the reins upon the horse's back he then dismounted and calling to me now young gentleman i's waiting he put a ladder up for me to get down by then turning to a porter he said to him bill you must take this ere young gemman and that ere parcel to this ere direction please to remember the coachman sir i replied that i certainly would if he wished it and walked off with the porter the coachman observing as i went away well he is a fool that's certain i arrived quite safe at st clement's lane when the porter received a shilling for his trouble from the maid who let me in and i was shown up into a parlour where i found myself in company with mrs handicock mrs handicock was a little meagre woman who did not speak very good english and who appeared to me to employ the major part of her time in bawling out from the top of the stairs to the servants below i never saw her either read a book or occupy herself with needlework during the whole time i was in the house she had a large grey parrot and i really cannot tell which screamed the worst of the two 
but she was very civil and kind to me before i had been there ten minutes she told me that she adored sailors they were the defendiers and preserviers of their kings and countries and that mr handicock would be home by four o'clock and then we should go to dinner as i was very anxious to see mr handicock and very anxious to have my dinner i was not sorry to hear the clock on the stairs strike four when mrs handicock jumped up and put her head over the banisters jemima jemima it's four o'clock i hear it ma'am replied the cook and she gave the frying pan a twist which made the hissing and the smell come flying up into the parlor and made me more hungry than ever rap tap tap there's your master jemima screamed the lady i hear him ma'am replied the cook run down my dear and let mr randy cock in said his wife he'll be so surprised at seeing you open the door i ran down as mrs handicock desired me and opened the street door who the devil are you in a gruff voice cried mr handicock a man about six feet high dressed in blue cotton net pantaloons and hessian boots with a black coat and waistcoat i was a little rebuffed i must own but i replied that i was mr simple and pray mr simple what would your grandfather say if he saw you now law mr andycock said his wife from the top of the stairs how can you be so cross i told him to open the door to surprise you and you have surprised me replied he with your cursed folly while mr handicock was rubbing his boots on the mat i went upstairs rather mortified i must own as my father had told me that mr handicock was his stockbroker and would do all he could to make me comfortable when i returned to the parlor mrs handicock whispered to me never mind my dear it's only because there's something wrong on change mr handicock is a bear just now i thought so too but made no answer for mr handicock came upstairs are you ready for your dinner my dear said the lady almost trembling if the dinner is ready for me i believe we usually dine at four answered her husband gruffly jemima jemima dish up do we hear jemima yes ma'am replied the cook directly i thicken the butter and mrs handicock resumed her seat with well mr simple and how is your grandfather lord privilege he is quite well ma'am answered i for the fifteenth time at least but dinner put an end to the silence which followed this remark mr handicock walked downstairs leaving his wife and me to follow at our leisure pray ma'am inquired i as soon as he was out of hearing what is the matter with mr handicock that he is so cross to you why my dear it is one of the misfortunes of matrimony that when the husband's put out the wife is sure to have a share of it are you people coming down to dinner roared mr handicock from below yes my dear replied the lady i thought that you were washing your hands we descended into the dining-room where we found that mr handicock had already devoured two of the whitings leaving only one on the dish for his wife and me would you like a little bit of whiting my dear said the lady to me it's not worth halving observed the gentleman in a surly tone taking up the fish with his own knife and fork and putting it on his plate well i'm so glad you like them my dear replied the lady meekly then turning to me there's some nice roast wheel coming my dear the veal made its appearance and fortunately for us mr handicock could not devour it all he took the lion's share nevertheless cutting off all the brown and then shoving the dish over to his wife to help herself and me after dinner mr handicock went down to the cellar for a bottle of wine oh dearie me exclaimed his wife he must a lost a mint o money we had better go upstairs and leave him alone he'll be better after a bottle of port perhaps i was very glad to go away and being very tired i went to bed without any tea for mrs handicock dared not venture to make it 
before her husband came upstairs. End of Peter Simple, Chapter 1 By Frederick Marriott Platero y yo, por Juan Ramón Jiménez Esta es una grabación para LibriVox. Todas las grabaciones de LibriVox están en el dominio público. Para más información o para ser voluntario, visite LibriVox.org. Grabado por Claudia Barrett. Capítulo primero. Platero. Platero es pequeño, peludo, suave, tan blando por fuera que se diría todo de algodón que no lleva huesos. Solo los espejos de azabache de sus ojos son duros, cual dos escarabajos de cristal negro. Lo dejo suelto y se va al prado, y acaricia tibiamente con su hocico, rozándolas apenas, las florecillas rosas, celestes y gualdas. Lo llamo dulcemente, platero, y viene a mí con un trotecillo alegre que parece que se ríe en no sé qué cascabeleo ideal. Come cuanto le doy. Le gustan las naranjas mandarinas, las uvas moscateles, todas de ámbar, los higos morados con su cristalina gotita de miel. Es tierno y mimoso, igual que un niño, que una niña, pero fuerte y seco como de piedra. Cuando paso sobre él los domingos, por las últimas callejas del pueblo, los hombres del campo, vestidos de limpio y despaciosos, de se quedan mirándolo. Tiene acero tiene acero, acero y plata de luna al mismo tiempo. Fin del capítulo primero de Platero y yo Grabado por Claudia Barrett The Book of Romans, Chapter 1, from the King James Version of the Bible. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Rebecca. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom are ye also called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is... I am ready to preach the gospel to you that you are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shewed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, 
even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed for ever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. End of Romans chapter 1. Recording by Rebecca. The Story of Dr. Doolittle, Chapter 1. Puddleby. By Hugh Lofting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. The First Chapter, Puddleby Once upon a time, many years ago, when our grandfathers were little children, there was a doctor, and his name was Doolittle, John Doolittle, M.D. M.D. means that he was a proper doctor and knew a whole lot. He lived in a little town called Puddleby on the Marsh. All the folks, young and old, knew him well by sight, and whenever he walked down the street in his high hat everyone would say, There goes the doctor, he's a clever man, and the dogs and the children would all run up and follow behind him, and even the crows that lived in the church tower would caw and nod their heads. The house he lived in on the edge of town was quite small, but his garden was very large, and had a wide lawn and stone seats, and weeping willows hanging over. His sister, Sarah Doolittle, was housekeeper for him, but the doctor looked after the garden himself. He was very fond of animals and kept many kinds of pets. Besides the goldfish in the pond at the bottom of his garden, he had rabbits in the pantry, white mice in his piano, a squirrel in the linen closet, and a hedgehog in the cellar. He had a cow with a calf, too, and an old lame horse twenty-five years of age, the chickens and pigeons and two lambs, and many other animals. But his favorite pets were Dab-Dab the duck, Jip the dog, Gub-Gub the baby pig, Polynesia the parrot, and the owl, Tutu. His sister used to grumble about all these animals and say they made the house untidy. And one day, when an old lady with rheumatism came to see the doctor, she sat on the hedgehog, who was sleeping on the sofa and never came to see him any more, but drove every Saturday all the way to Oxenthorpe, another town ten miles off, to see a different doctor. Then his sister, Sarah Doolittle, came to him and said, "'John, how can you expect sick people to come and see you when you keep all these animals in the house? It's a fine doctor would have his parlor full of hedgehogs and mice. That's the fourth personage these animals have driven away. Squire Jenkins and the parson say they wouldn't come near your house again, no matter how sick they are. We are getting poorer every day. If you go on like this, none of the best people will have you for a doctor.' "'But I like the animals better than the best people.' said the doctor. "'You are ridiculous,' said his sister, and walked out of the room. So as time went on the doctor got more and more animals, and the people who came to see him got less and less, till at last he had no one left except the cat's meat man who didn't mind any kind of animals. But the cat's meat man wasn't very rich, and he only got sick once a year, at Christmas time, when he used to give the doctor sixpence for a bottle of medicine.' 
sixpence a year wasn't enough to live on even in those days long ago, and if the doctor hadn't had some money saved up in his money box, no one knows what would have happened. And he kept on getting still more pets, and of course it cost a lot to feed them, and the money he had saved up grew littler and littler. Then he sold his piano, and let the mice live in a bureau drawer. But the money he got for that too began to go, so he sold the brown suit he wore on Sundays, and went on becoming poorer and poorer. And now, when he walked down the street in his high hat, people would say to one another, "'There goes John Doolittle, M.D. There was a time when he was the best-known doctor in the West Country. Look at him now. He hasn't any money, and his stockings are full of holes.' But the dogs and the cats and the children still ran up and followed him through the town, the same as they had done when he was rich. End of The Story of Dr. Doolittle, Chapter 1, Puddleby, by Hugh Lofting